we'll finish off here with the usual practice questions. The chlorides of elements in period three of the periodic table show different behaviors on addition to water depending on their structure and bonding. Write equations to show the behavior of sodium chloride and silicon chloride, SiCl4, when separately added to an excess of water. So depending on the, on the type of bonding and structure, there will be a different type of behavior when we add water. And we know now that if it's ionic, we're generally going to have the ionic compound or substance dissolving in the water, just separating into ions. If it is a covalent compound, we're going to have hydrolysis, so an actual reaction with water and often the subsequent production of HCl as well. But let's look at the two equations. So sodium chloride ionic, so it's going to be NaCl, and we can show the addition of water by just putting plus Aq. That will then form Na plus ions and Cl minus ions. Okay, if we had to add state symbols, that would be an S for solid, Aq and Aq for dissolved in water. What about the silicon tetrachloride? When that dissolves in water, or when it reacts with water, we know we're going to have a quite a vigorous hydrolysis reaction because it is a covalent compound. So that will be Si. Cl4, is it a solid or liquid? It is a liquid. Remember that colorless liquid at room temperature. It will actually react with water. So I'll add water as a reactant or a reagent. Water is a liquid. We know we form HCl, which is a gas. So the observation will be the steamy fumes. And in addition to that, what else do we produce? We produce silicon dioxide, SiO2, which is very insoluble in water. So it will be observed as a white solid. State and explain the differences in behavior of these two chlorides when added to water in terms of their structure and the bonding found in the compounds. So I did refer to that this answer quite vaguely when we, when we wrote down our equations. So let's put it a bit more concisely. So sodium chloride in terms of structure and bonding. Sodium chloride is ionic. Okay, so ionic bonding but we also have to mention the structure. Okay, so you have to add, you have to add that it it also has a a giant structure okay, or giant ionic. I know we've mentioned ionic already, so you can just put giant there. Okay, so therefore, because it's it's an ionic substance, what's gonna gonna happen when we add water? The sodium chloride dissolves. Okay, that's it. It won't react with water to produce any new products. The ions will simply dissociate or separate. Okay, so sodium chloride dissolves, or you can put it does not react. So what about the silicon tetrachloride, okay, the SiCl4? In terms of bonding, it is not ionic, it's covalent because it's between two nonmetals. So we know it's definitely covalent. But in terms of structure, we also have to add the following. It is Covalent, but the structure is a simple molecular. Simple molecular structure. So therefore, what type of reaction will take place? Okay, so these covalent chlorides, same as the covalent oxides, will undergo hydrolysis. They okay, would react with the water. So the SiCl4 is hydrolyzed. Or you can just write undergoes hydrolysis. So that means it actually reacts with the water. Okay, but this type of reaction is very important. Okay, it's critical that you know when something will undergo hydrolysis and when it will just dissolve. So ionic, it will generally just dissolve. If it is covalent, it will react with the water in a type of reaction known as hydrolysis. Silicon tetrachloride SiCl4 is formed when silicon reacts with chlorine under suitable conditions. It is a colorless liquid with a low boiling point. Explain why it has a low boiling point. So remember when we refer to, or when we have to explain melting and boiling points, we have to refer to the type of bonding and structure because that will allow us to identify the type of force that we have to break when something changes phase. So for silicon chloride, we know that it is simple molecular, 
Okay, so that will be your, your first point, simple covalent or simple molecular. And because of that, why do we have acting between molecules? So it doesn't form a giant structure. It forms simple molecules between the individual molecules. We only have weak intermolecular forces or van der Waals forces that needs to be broken. Okay, so you need to mention the fact that we have weak London forces or van der Waals forces. I'm just using kind of abbreviations here, van der Waals forces or the instantaneous dipole, induced dipole forces. Another way to kind of put down the same argument is to say that only a small amount of energy is needed to break these forces. So you either specify that they're weak or a small amount of energy is needed to break these forces. Silicon tetrachloride reacts with water to produce an acidic solution, write an equation. So it's the same equation we've had on the previous slide. So SiCl4 plus water, not adding any state symbols here. We've done it in the previous one and they're not asking for it. So we're going to produce silicon dioxide plus hydrogen chloride. And just remember to balance a four there and we need a two in front of water. You will also come across a, another version of this equation. Uh, sometimes instead of referring to silicon dioxide as a product, you can also have SiOH4, okay, so silicon hydroxide, which is also an insoluble product that will form. So also a, a white solid. So either of those two will be correct. So generally this is the one most often used. But if you see this one used in a question, I don't think it's some it's a different reaction. It's just a version, different version of this reaction equation. And then lastly, describe two visual observations when the silicon tetrachloride is added drop by drop to a small amount of water. So let's look at what we produce, HCl. So we know we're going to produce steamy fumes or white fumes or misty fumes. And the silicon dioxide is insoluble, so that will be observed as a white solid. The table below gives data for some of the oxides of period three elements. So I know we're dealing with chlorides here, but let's answer this question about the oxides. So they give us some melting points. And then we have to complete the table by referring to the type of bonding using only the words ionic or covalent. Sodium oxide, metal, non-metal, so ionic. Magnesium oxide, metal, non-metal, so only also ionic. Aluminium oxide, metal, non-metal, so you really go for ionic. But we know that aluminium oxide does also have a degree of covalent character, so they will actually accept ionic or covalent as the correct answer for aluminium oxide. Silicon dioxide, we know covalent between two non-metals and the same for the phosphorus oxide and the, the sulfur dioxide as well. Both of these are covalent compounds. And then the structure ionic will always be giant. So we always only have to use the word simple or giant. Ionic without exception will be giant structures. Okay, a crystal lattice or a giant ionic structure. Silicon dioxide, we know generally covalent substances will be simple molecular, but we do have the few exceptions, silicon dioxide, diamond, graphite, and then th uh, things like graphene, etc. But silicon dioxide, as I said, is, is giant, it is not simple molecular. And then the other two simple molecular structures, so simple and simple. From the table of oxides above, suggest the formula of one oxide that is completely insoluble in water. So silicon dioxide, definitely insoluble in water, but also aluminium oxide. Okay, so either of those two, silicon dioxide or aluminium oxide. Remember we said that aluminium is protected by a layer of aluminium oxide on the outside. That, that's why aluminium will not rust or undergo 
corrosion because it's protected by that insoluble layer of aluminium oxide on the outside so it protects the inside aluminium okay from water i know it's not part of the question here but see if you can make a, a link between these melting points and the type of bonding and structure okay so should ionic substances have high melting points yes because we have a large number of strong ionic bonds to break or the attraction electrostatic attraction between an obsolete charged ions in the giant covalent structure okay, again we have a large number of strong covalent bonds to break and then in these simple molecular structures it's only weaker intermolecular forces or van der Waals forces and because of the the high melting points remember these are classified as ceramics magnesium oxide aluminium oxide and silicon dioxide because they can withstand very high temperatures, so we use them to line things like furnaces. Separate samples of sodium oxide and sulfur dioxide were added to water. For each oxide, write a balance equation for its reaction with water and suggest a numerical value for the pH of the resulting solution. So sodium oxide reacting with water, so it is a metal oxide. Reacting with water will form a metal hydroxide. So this will be sodium hydroxide, NaOH, and in terms of, of balancing the, the equation, and we're going to need two in front of NaOH, because we've got two sodiums on the, on the left-hand side. Notes, no state symbols required, but if we had two, sodium oxide is a white solid, water is a liquid, and sodium hydroxide is a very soluble hydroxide, so an aqueous solution. Because it's so soluble, we're going to have a, a very high pH because there's going to be a high concentration of OH minus ions in solution. So the pH will be yeah, kind of anywhere between 12 and 14 will be a, a good answer to give. The next one, SO2 plus, plus water. SO2 is a gas plus water. It's an acidic oxide, so we know, we know we're going to produce an acid, and in this case, it will be H2SO3. So if you had to give the systematic name, it's not self, uh, it will either be sulfurous acid. Okay, so how do we distinguish between the di two different types of sulfuric acid, H2SO3 and H2SO4? We have to give the oxidation number or the oxidation state of the sulfur and an SO3 it's going to be 4. So this will be sulfuric 4 acid. H2SO4 would be sulfuric 6 acid. Anyway, this is in solution, so AQ. The pH of this resulting solution, H2SO3 is a much weaker acid than H2SO4, okay, sulfuric 6 acid. So the pH won't be that low. So they'll allow quite a, quite a range here, anything between two and five it would if it was sulfuric acid h2so4 then it would be uh, one to two would be the uh, sensible ph to put down for that one and what determines the ph if we have an acid it's not the concentration of oh minus ions in this case but we're going to look at the concentration of h plus ultimately it's uh, always going to be a balance between those two concentrations because we always have both of those types of ions in solution but we'll consider that more detail next year when we take acids and bases a little bit further the last question here construct a balance equation for the reaction that occurs when a solution of sodium oxide in water reacts with a solution of so2 so we've looked at what happens when we add them to water we produce sodium hydroxide and we produce sulfuric 4 acid so that is what we're going to start with so it will be h2 so3 plus NaOH. So it's in solution, so all of these state symbols will be AQ if they wanted you to give state symbols. So when a metal hydroxide reacts with a dilute acid, we form a salt. In this case, the salt will be sodium sulfite. Remember the cation will take the place of the hydrogen, so it will be Na2 SO3 because Na is plus one and SO3 is two minus. So it will be, what's the general equation? We produce a salt plus water. 
Okay, so salt plus H2O and make sure you, you balance your equation. So two in front of sodium hydroxide and two in front of water. PCL5, PCL3 and NCL3 are halides of group 15 elements. PCL5, phosphorus pentachloride, can be formed from the reaction of phosphorus with chlorine. And PCL5 has a melting point of 161 degrees Celsius. Write an equation for the formation of PCL5 from the reaction of phosphorus and chlorine. So phosphorus as an element, okay, so don't forget about P4, okay, because it's four phosphorus atoms in each one of those molecules, reacting with chlorine, and we're going to form PCL5. So to balance the equation, we're going to need to get the chlorines up to well, let's start. We're going to have to put a 4 in front of phosphorus to balance the, the phosphorus atoms. And then 4 times 5, 20 chlor chlorine atoms. So we need a 10 in front of Cl2. State the type of structure and bonding shown by liquid PCl5. So remember, uh, PCl5 is at room temperature. It is a, a solid, as can be seen from that quite a high melting point. But if we go above 161, okay, what is the structure and, and bonding in that liquid? It's between two non-metals, so the, the bonding is covalent. And what is the structure? It is a simple covalent structure, as you need both of those terms. Okay, so covalent bonding okay, and simple molecular or simple covalent. A small amount of PCl5 is added to excess water. It reacts vigorously in that exothermic reaction to form a colorless solution. Give one other observation you would make when PCl5 reacts with excess water. So in addition to form that acidic colorless solution, the phosphoric acid, there will also be HCl produced. And what is the observation generally when we produce HCl gas? It is steamy or misty fumes. Write the equation for the reaction of PCl5 with, with excess water. Estimate the pH of the resulting solution. So we have phosphoric acid and we have HCl gas being produced. So we know it's going to be acidic. H3PO4, phosphoric 4 acid, sorry, phosphoric 5 acid is, is quite a strong acid. So the pH will be quite low. So anything around one to two, even three, will be a sensible answer here. Phosphorus is a non-metal in the third period. It reacts vigorously with excess oxygen, but slowly with chlorine. Some reactions of phosphorus are shown. Write an equation to represent reaction one, the formation of compound A. So it's the reaction between phosphorus and oxygen to form compound A, which will be the oxide of phosphorus, so phosphorus will be P4 plus O2, and we know the oxide formed is P4 O10. And to balance this one, we only need to put a, a 5 in front of the oxygen. Give two observations you could make in reaction 2. So let's consider the reaction. It's between phosphorus and chlorine to produce PCl5. So let's, let's just consider those compounds. So PCl5 is a white solid. So that could be one observation you could make. You're going to produce a white solid. The, the reaction between the phosphorus and, and the chlorine, the phosphorus will, will actually burn. And we know that the flame of phosphorus will generally be a white flame. That's another possible observation. But uh, probably the, the second obvious one would be to consider chlorine gas, okay, the other reagent, what's going to happen when we use up the chlorine gas? What's the appearance of chlorine gas? It's a kind of a yellow or green color. So as it reacts with the phosphorus, the yellow green color will disappear. So I think the two obvious ones there would be the white solid formed. So we know PCl5 is a white solid. We know chlorine gas, it's got a yellow green appearance. And as it reacts, that color will disappear. Okay, the white flame will probably be a less obvious one.
in this reaction with chlorine. If it was, a, if it was phosphorus burning in oxygen, it would have been a very obvious one. Name compound B. So it's a reaction between P cell 5 and water. We've, I think we're doing this one for a third time now, if not the fourth time. We know in addition to HCl, which we observe as the steamy fumes, we're going to produce an acidic solution and it's as a result of the production of phosphoric 5 acid. We have to name it, so this is where that systematic name will be important. Yes, it's probably going to be easy to remember it's phosphoric acid, but you need to give the oxidation state or the oxidation number of the phosphorus in that acid. So phosphoric 5 acid. Maybe start with the with the formula. It was H3PO4, and then you can use that to work out the oxidation number of phosphorus. Silicon forms a tetrachloride SiCl4. Which statements are correct? In SiCl4, the silicon is delta plus, and each chlorine is delta minus. So if we draw, it's not a three-dimensional diagram. We just draw it in two dimensions, so these are single covalent bonds. How do we decide which one will be delta plus, delta minus? It's based on electronegativity. We, need, we know that silicon and chloride found in the same period, period three, but as we go from left to right across a period, there's an increase in electronegativity. Remember, fluorine has got the highest electronegativity on the periodic table, top right, so anything moving towards that top right corner will show an increase in electronegativity. But anyway, if it's in the same period, an element with a, a higher nuclear charge will have a, a stronger attraction for a bonding pair of electrons because the outer shell will be slightly closer okay, to, the, to the nucleus because we know there's a, there's a decrease in the size of these atoms as we go across the period. Okay, so after all of that, we know that chlorine will have a higher electronegativity than silicon. So chlorine will be delta minus in all of these, and the silicon will be delta plus. Is that the statement? Yes, it is, so that one is correct. SiCl4 is a liquid at room temperature. Yes, it is a colorless liquid. That's just going to be kind of a bit that you have to memorize. Okay, PCl5 is a white solid. And then SiCl4 reacts with water to give an acidic solution and a precipitate. Is that correct? Yes, we, we do form HCl, so it will form an acidic solution. We observe those steamy fumes. And in addition to the HCl, what else is produced? A silicon dioxide, which is very insoluble in water. So that will be observed as a white solid or a white precipitate. So that is also correct. So all three options, one, two, and three, I think that's option A. And this is the last one, the last question of the last lesson, of the last chapter. There will be one more lesson, but that's just to apply some of these trends to some unknown elements and to make some predictions. So you can look at that video, not look at it. This will be the last official one. So after this, we, we're done with all the content. So at 200 degrees Celsius, aluminum chloride exists as a dimer, Al2Cl6 and not AlCl3. Aluminium trichloride. Draw the structure of Al2Cl6 showing fully any coordinate or dative covalent bonds in the molecule. So this is a, a good opportunity for you to practice how to draw the structure of for this Al2Cl6 so that you can do it in, in the exam situation. The e easiest is to start with one of those units one aluminium with three chlorines. Aluminium in group three or 13, so three valence electrons, so three dots. Chlorine in group 17 or seven, so seven valence electrons. So it will form three single covalent bonds uh, between the chlorine and the aluminium. I'm missing it across there. And then we have to add another one of these units. But if we look at aluminium, it's got six electrons at the moment. We're trying to give it a, a full outer shell or full outer electron shell or an octet. So the only way to do that is to get two electrons from chlorine. So in other words, chlorine must donate both electrons in that bonding pair, and that's going to be our first dative covalent bond. Okay, so I'm going to draw another chlorine, chlorine there with 
it's seven electrons. Okay, but then it needs to form a bond with aluminium. So I'm going to draw my aluminium atom here. So it's forming a normal single covalent bond. And then here we have our, our second dative covalent bond, both these electrons from this chlorine atom. But then just finish your aluminium atom. It needs three valence electrons, so two more dots. Okay, so one, one, two. But anyway, we're missing two chlorine atoms still. We need a unit AlCl3, so we're going to add in another chlorine and another chlorine. And then you just make up the full outer shell with seven crosses for each one of those. If they don't ask for a dot and cross diagram specifically, you can probably speed it up by doing the, the following. You can draw your aluminium bonded to one, two, three chlorines, okay, and then another chlorine, another aluminium. Okay, so this aluminium must also be bonded to three chlorines. And then you just have to be sensible where you put your dative covalent bonds. So these will be the usual normal single covalent bonds. This is a dative covalent bond that chlorine will donate both electrons in that bonding pair. This is going to be a dative covalent bond where the chlorine atom donates both bonding pair electrons. And then these are just normal single covalent bonds. So that would be another way of speeding up the process. But if they wanted a dot and cross diagram, they would just have to give this longer answer.